Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and I'm going to talk about a deadly design deficiency of the Concorde that led to its final demise as an operational uh, supersonic aircraft. Uh, it's an amazing design, but it had a very serious design flaw, and I'm going to talk about that in detail. But a little history on the accident. On the uh, 25th of July, 2000, Air France Flight 4590, which was a Concorde uh, passenger jet from Paris uh, to New York, crashed shortly after takeoff. Um, it's only fatal accident in 27 years, which is quite remarkable given this deficiency. 109 people on board the aircraft died, as well as four on the ground that were in a hotel it hit. Now, what happened is uh, the aircraft... Uh, ran over some debris on the runway that was left by a Continental DC-10-30. It was a little fragment called a wear strip out of one of the engines, about 17 inches long and just over an inch wide, but made out of titanium. And what happened is the uh, Concorde ran over uh, this piece of material and it, it damaged uh, the tire, caused the tire essentially to disintegrate. Now, they, uh, they hit this uh, piece of strip by when they're doing 185 miles per hour, and the, the tires exploded. Now, the interesting thing is the tire did not actually penetrate uh, the fuel cell. It actually caused a shock wave that caused the fuel cell to fail, obviously, at its weakest point and start uh, spewing out fuel in the number one and two engines. It also damaged uh, the gear. Um, so they were not able to uh, retract it. They figure that the tire fragment hit the um, underside of the fuel tank at roughly 310 miles per hour, and it weighed 9.9 .9 pounds. So uh, a 10-pound object at 310 miles per hour has a lot of force. Uh, kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, and that's an equation that's very important in this. Now, uh, you may say, man, 185 miles per hour, that's pretty fast. Well, uh, the efficient design for a high-speed supersonic aircraft is a delta wing, and unfortunately, you can't put slats or flaps on it, and so you have to have a lot higher speed. So that's the first part of the issue, is you're going to be operating at very high speeds, and high speeds are always dangerous because the old kinetic energy equation, uh, kinetic energy is one-half mass times velocity squared. You ever notice on a takeoff roll, like the first part of the takeoff roll below 100 knots, it goes pretty quickly. Second part, it seems to slow down. And you wonder, well, why does it slow down? Well, the simple thing is you're generating kinetic energy with the thrust from the engines. And 60 squared, 60 miles per hour squared, is a lot lower number than 120 miles per hour squared. So it takes a lot more energy uh, imparting to the aircraft uh, to advance. Now, another thing about this design, and it's... Uh, you know, the, the U.S. had a design. It's hard to uh, complain about the Concorde because the Boeing design never got off the ground. But the guy who was the chairman of the new Aircraft Evaluation and Certification Committee before me actually worked uh, for Boeing on this design. But one thing they did was they separated the engines. Because the problem on, uh, you know, when you cluster engines like this, and, and this occurred, uh, engine number one and two uh, failed, and uh, they got... Uh, partial thrust back on number one, but uh, they lost essentially, you know, two engines. Uh, they had trouble with an aileron, uh, elevon that uh, was was damaged, uh, which caused them roll control issues. And um, they also uh, ingested hot gas into these two engines right there, and it caused them uh, to initially surge and fail. So they've got the gear hanging. Uh, they've, they've got fire. They've got a control uh, controllability situation and only two out of four engines. And, you know, it, it, anybody who has a multi-engine rating knows that you don't lose half the thrust. You can lose up to 80% of the excess thrust when you lose one or or one engine. In this case, we got a pair engine, so it's equivalent of losing one out of two engines. So they lose a lot of extra thrust, and they are really uh, behind the power curve on this whole thing. And supposedly they're actually slightly slow on the takeoff. The aircraft was just about 2,000 pounds over maximum gross weight, which percentage-wise is not uh, terribly significant and wasn't really a big factor. There are a couple other little things I'm not going to get into. But, okay, part of the issue with this is the, the delta wing causes you to fly at very high speeds. Now, this aircraft, uh, you know, was, uh, was produced 
a long time ago. And when I when I flew uh, with the, um, the the Airbus test pilots, every single one of them had been uh, almost without a, an exception a Concorde test pilot, and they, they let you know about that. But uh, I mean that was that was pretty cool because they had a, a Concorde setting down there at Toulouse that all of them had flown. But let's talk a little bit about um, aircraft design here. Now, if it weren't for Cain and Abel getting into a fight way back when and led to the development of better clubs and better weapons and bows and arrows and stuff like that, if it weren't for conflict, we would not have most likely technological advancement and we would be walking everywhere uh, naked because, uh, you know, we never developed airplanes. But that's not the way history has unfolded. The B-58 uh, and Development comes, obviously, through the military realm because the military needs the best and most capable performance, and they're the ones that always push the technology. And, of course, it's a lot more acceptable to have issues with military aircraft than to just uh, plop these designs on the civilian realm. Now, let's talk about the B-58 Hustler. Now, this was an aircraft that is often considered to be ahead of its time. And you notice it has the delta wing platform, which is very efficient at high speeds. And you notice how the engines are separated. So if you have a problem with one engine, uh, it's not going to necessarily, like it disintegrates, propagate to the others. But you have a little issue at high speeds of having an unstart where you have disturbed airflow because a jet engine cannot take supersonic airflow into the compressor. It has to what's known as shock it down. So it is a, the, the inlets are made, so you form a shock wave and you get lower speed air. Um, and often uh, it, it gets very complicated and the equations just get amazing. Uh, but uh, you can have oblique shocks, normal shocks, but you got to get the air down to uh, subsonic uh, for the, uh, the compressor to accept the air and being able to operate, unless you have a scramjet, and, and we're not going to get into that, but because that's kind of a little bit how the SR-71 operates in certain phases. But anyway, uh, I'm digressing here. Uh, the, the whole issue is the B-58 was ahead of its time. It really was. And um, it, it did not have as sophisticated a flight control as it should have. And if you would get an unstart on one of the engines and the airplane ended up going sideways, which it could very easily because the, uh, these things have a lot of drag at high speed, uh, it would get in, uh, end up going sideways and the biggest piece you would recover would be uh, one of the throttle knobs, they used to say. Now, of course, we're talking about a very advanced aircraft here, the SR-71, and this never went out of the realm of, um, you know, uh, very capable pilots operating it. And this aircraft had a lot of issues. Uh, Unstart was one of the biggest ones where it could end up going sideways. And it was just basically a very dangerous and high-performance aircraft to fly. And Bob Gilliland, uh, that's me and my wife there at a Society Experimental Test Pilot meeting. Bob Gilliland was the chief test pilot on this and did all the first flights. And, of course, it was extremely secret. And it's one of those things where you come home and, well, what do you do for work? Well, you, you make up some story, uh, you know, because it was very secret for a very long time. But uh, he had a lot of stories, and I talk about him in another video. Uh, but he suffered a lot of very uh, extreme emergencies and kept control of the aircraft. And it, it had a very good uh, history until it was, it was finally retired, but it had some significant accidents. But again, it's on the cutting edge of technology. Okay, the XB-49. Uh, this did not have a sophisticated flight control system, and it had pitch stability issues, uh, basically being a flying wing. Um, and uh, Edwards Air Force Base is named uh, after the co-pilot, um, Captain Edwards. And why would you name a base, a, you know, a military base after the co-pilot? That's because the uh, the uh, head pilot of it was a contractor pilot, uh, and you don't never name a Air Force Base after a contractor pilot. Uh, but I talk about that in another video. But anyway, uh, the airplane had issues. And there's a lot of politics with this and the and the B-36 and things like that, um, which might actually make a good video to talk about that uh, in, in the history aspect and uh, that. But anyway, uh, the aircraft was eventually canceled and scrapped, although quite a few of them had been built. But here we got the B-2. 
and the B-2 had the sophisticated flight control systems that would allow this type of aircraft to fly very well and very successfully. Um, so technology advanced to the point where the issues were overcome. And uh, funny side little thing here, uh, Bruce Hines was a chief test pilot on that. I knew Bruce uh, from out at Edwards. We had, we had flown together out there. And uh, he, um, for five years, could not tell anybody uh, that he worked for Northrop. And uh, finally, after five years, he could say, yeah, I work for Northrop. But then for another two years, he couldn't even say he was a pilot, let alone what he was working on. So uh, yeah, very secret program. Uh, very interesting. But we're getting, we're getting better here now. Uh, the F-16 um, is basically uncontrollable without the flight control computers. And it will essentially, uh, if you lost all the augmentation, uh, the stability augmentation, the aircraft would go out of control in approximately nine tenths of a second. Uh, if the pilot only had direct stick, uh, you know, direct stick to uh, um, surface movement. And um, I like this picture because I was the one chasing it um, uh, with a photo photographer in back. Of course, he's the one taking the pictures. I'm doing the flying. And uh, this is one of my chase pictures, so I like it. But the F-16, uh, of course, uh, proved to be a very good aircraft. The design had matured at this point. Uh, so a lot of the, the problems that uh, existed with early design, especially in flight control systems, uh, no longer was an issue. And of course, we got the space shuttle. Now, that's kind of interesting. This, this was an aircraft, spacecraft, that again is a vehicle that was ahead of its time. Uh, the tiles were a weak point and uh, you know it was a good idea. It was always a desire to be able to essentially uh, take off from a runway, which, which they couldn't do of course, but take off from a runway, fly into space and come back uh, like an airplane. And uh, you know it, it had a reasonably successful program if, if you want to call it like that. It did a lot of good work but it um, uh, you know, they lost two of them in the, uh, the course of the program, but uh, it, uh, it was kind of determined that, well, this is, we're, we're not quite ready for this. So guess what? We're back to this using capsules again. And of course, a lot of the high-speed data initially came from the X-15. And of course, here we have a, a, a winged platform. Now, this was a hypersonic vehicle. Uh, it could go up Mach 5 and that. Um, and its main issues, of course, were heating, and they had some uh, issues with the program towards the end, uh, you know, because it because uh, of the the heating issues. And same thing with the XB70. They uh, this aircraft actually um, developed a lot of the data that was used really to develop uh, the Concorde, and that's um, you know basically uh, led to the ability of the uh, uh, consortium to actually build this aircraft. And this is a picture of the uh, the Concorde that was involved in the accident uh, before, obviously, before it was involved in the accident. That kind of goes without saying. And here's the DC-10-30 owned by Continental at the time. Now, I want to talk about the whole issue of the warnings that they had. Uh, over the 27 years of service that the Concorde had, there were 70 tire and wheel related incidents, seven of which caused serious damage to the aircraft or were potentially catastrophic. Okay, um, 70 down to seven. Uh, you know, you had a lot of warning here. There was a lot of information that you needed to look at this. In fact, the NTSB said, hey, you guys need to look at this because you got a disaster waiting to happen. And that's what finally happened. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of the incidents. I mean, this is what was telling the guys, hey, you got a problem. You need to address this. On June 13 to 79, the number uh, five and six tires blew out during a takeoff from Washington Dulles and fragments uh, of the tires and the rims damaged the number two engine, punctured three fuel cells, severed uh, several hydraulic lines and electrical wires, and tore a large hole in the top of the wing over the wheel well area. They were able to bring it back. On July 21st, 79, another blown tire incident during a takeoff from Dulles. Uh, that incident um, 
they uh, they they got a little bit concerned and they issued an airworthiness directive and and uh, they they issued some technical information calling for uh, revised procedures. Uh, this included uh, inspection of each wheel, tire for condition, pressure and temperature prior to each takeoff, and um, in addition, the crews were advised that the landing gear should not be raised when you have a wheel tire problem. Well, that's fairly normal. Um, you know, if you if you have a problem uh, with a tire, with a uh, something like that, it is best to leave the gear down because you don't want it necessarily even to jam in the, the gear well. At least if you've got something down there to roll on uh, when you come into land, that's better than no, uh, nothing. And in August of 81, a British Airways uh, Concorde taken off from New York suffered a blowout Damaged landing gear doors, engine, and fuel tank. On November of 85, a tire burst on a, a British Air, uh, Airways uh, Concorde leaving Heathrow, uh, causing damage to landing gear door and fuel tank. Two engines were damaged as a result of the accident. Uh, January 88, again, British Airways leaving uh, uh, Heathrow lost four bolts from its land, uh, landing gear wheel and a fuel tank was punctured. On July of 93, a tire burst on a uh, British um, Airways uh, Concorde during uh, landing at Heathrow, causing substantial ingestion damage to the number three engine and damaging the landing gear and wing and puncturing an empty fuel tank. In October of 93, a tire burst on a uh, British um, Airways Concorde during taxi to Heathrow, puncturing the wing, damaging the fuel tanks, and causing a major fuel leak. Now the whole thing here is you got you got an issue with the design being a delta wing. No leading edge, no trailing edge devices. Speeds are going to be higher. Okay, if speeds are going to be higher, you have to take much more care of the possibility of damage because it's the old kinetic energy 1 fmv squared. You throw a rotating tire off at the higher speeds, you you've got to have the shielding. And they later in, uh you know, they tried to correct this by installing Kevlar and stuff like that and doing certain shielding procedures. But the Concorde uh, was never really financially beneficial. You know, it never made a profit. It was more of a um, national pride sort of airline. And it's a beautiful aircraft. I mean, it's unfortunate it had this demise. But these design errors led to that. And it was... Before its time, not properly uh, designed. And, and by that, I'm talking about they're probably uh, material issues because uh, if you design this aircraft now, you would know better to shield the tanks uh, better, uh, to do certain things to uh, minimize damage like this. But, but once this, this tank ruptured, uh, flames went into the two engines close together, uh, and they flamed out. Uh, they just didn't have the thrust. They were losing control. They actually did uh, virtually a 180 degree turn before they came back, uh, came around and crashed into the hotel. And just as a side note, the DC-10-30 uh, uh, didn't have a very good future uh, either. But it it didn't in involve uh, anybody dying, fortunately, and it ended up uh, basically in the trash at a boneyard so uh it had a rather inglorious uh ending also so i hope you found that interesting thanks for watching